Um, and the more I wrote about them, the more I realized that this was a story, my story and bits and pieces of their stories, really this collective experience that I wanted to tell. Like I couldn't help write about it. Welcome to our Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest today is Simone Guarino, and we are going to be talking about her memoir, The Wives. I had the pleasure of meeting Simone at a lunch, a publisher lunch, a couple of months ago, and we just sat talking and going, and I said, I really have got to A, read this book, and B, talk to this woman when the, I finally have read it, and we can have some conversation. As I'm interviewing her, uh, we haven't done our review yet. It's going to be running, not next week, it's going to be running the following. But I wanted to at least share a review, a quote that I saw from a starred review. She got three starred reviews, everybody, from Publishers Weekly, which called it a hauntingly, beautifully written celebration of found sisterhood. And I love that because it embodies one of the themes that we definitely see in the book. And with that intro, welcome, Simone. So good to see you again. Thank you. It's so lovely to see you, Carol. I am honored to be here. Super excited to talk to you. So at what point did you say, I'm going to write a memoir? Like, where did that happen from? <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I, you know, had been writing essays for quite some time. I'd had a background in, in journalism, and then I moved into more personal writing. And I, you know, I actually had some agents reach out to me over the years saying, do you want to write a memoir about being an army wife. And I said, no way. I, I, <laughs> I don't want to write. I don't think I can write a whole book about this. Um, and also, you know, it's a funny thing because really our responsibility as it's told to us as wives is to be silent. And there's so much we're not supposed to say in terms mm -hmm. of protecting, um, you know, national security and our our husband's whereabouts so that was also something that i was concerned about um but when i moved to washington from georgia i had a little baby she was two and a half months old she's now seven and my husband continued to be gone just as much as he had in in georgia and i found that i really missed the wives the other women um that i'd gotten close to in georgia and I started writing about them. Um, and the more I wrote about them, the more I realized that this was a story, my story and bits and pieces of their stories, really this collective experience that I wanted to tell. Like I couldn't help write about it. At the same time, the more I wrote about it, the more I realized this is not a story that gets any airtime. Mm -hmm. This is not a life experience people think much about and it's also a centuries old life experience you know mm -hmm. it is something that is that has been going on forever um and i think there's also just something really universal at the core of the story or i hope there is and in, in, in terms of the friendships that's really just about how we can lighten each other's load um because there's just so much to being alive that we cannot navigate without each other. So that aspect of the story is really what drew me in to writing a book. I didn't want to just write a book about this is my life as an army wife. I really wanted to write about that building of a community and those complicated and rich friendships that were built in pretty pressurized conditions. Yeah, really pressurized conditions. You know, yeah. and it's really interesting because Kristen Hanna's book, The Women, came out in um, be beginning of February. So many people gravitated towards that because same thing, it's something we didn't know anything about is the women who were the nurses in women of Vietnam. And what mm -hmm. I feel is there's a parallel between these books because there's another thing about the wives that we, I've known a couple of wives. I know a couple of people. But I haven't known completely their stories of what went on. I know what to say when their husbands are being deployed. I know the excitement when their husbands come home on leave. But I don't really know about the community and the bonds that you have to uh, to form. And I think that's what you did such a great job at. So let's back up for a second, though, and go back to Andrew uh, sitting there telling you one day that he was thinking about the career military as a career. And what about your early years when he made that decision? Because it's like, hello, I'd like to join the army. And you're sitting there defining <laughs> yourself as a pacifist. And I'm going to go one thing. 
And, and then a counseling session, he says, that if there's a choice between the army and you, he would choose the army. And you're just sitting there like, okay, I think he really wants to hear this. So how did you feel hearing all of this? Because that's not the relationship you went into. <laughs> Yeah, I am. Um, gosh, I just want to say that I haven't read Kristen Hannon's book, but I just, it's about to arrive at my doorstep. I'm so excited. I listened to your interview with her and I thought so much about those parallels and also mm -hmm. just about women vets today, because actually bef right before Andrew joined, I did a lot of reporting on women veterans and how hard they were trying, they were trying to get disability benefits who they had basically been in combat because it was this 360 degree bat battlefield, they call it, you know, so they had really struggled to get them. And um, I just realized that there's just like so many stories of invisible women. And I just mm -hmm. love that Kristen mm -hmm. Hannah's talking. Yeah. Okay. So I just, <laughs> I just <laughs> wanted to say, I love her, but Oh, gosh. Yes. I had not expected that when Andrew told me I am I'm thinking about joining the military. We just moved in together. You know, we both had come from really pacifistic backgrounds and um, he had grown up on a hippie commune. And when we first started dating, he'd been thinking about starting a bar in Spain and he was a bartender. So it was not on my radar. Mm -hmm. um, and I just said, I would leave you like that just came out of my mouth. Um, and he didn't say anything about it for two more years. And then, you know, time went on and then it became very clear that it was, this thing was not going away. Right. Um, so much so that when we were engaged years later, he, you know, in couples counseling said, if it's you or the army, I choose the army, which I think, you know, is somewhat shocking to a lot of people. And it was a little bit shocking to me in the moment. I've now lived with that reality for so long. It feels like just a fact of my life. Um, but he was so sure about us. He was mm -hmm. so sure at the beginning, like, I'm going to marry you. So I knew when he said that, I mean, it felt very much like the rug being tugged out from underneath my feet, but it also just told me like, wow, this is a calling. This is a conviction. This is mm -hmm. something he feels so strongly about. Mm -hmm. This is like, if somebody said, don't, don't write ever again to me, maybe, you know, so that put it in perspective for me. So. Yeah. And it's like, he was definitely saying, this is um, what I want to do. And it wasn't at a timing, like right after 9-11, it wasn't, mm -hmm. it was later. And we knew a lot of people that felt that way right after 9-11, I have to go be a part of this. But where he came from was not like just, oh, this is what's going on in the world. And I've got to do this. It's a real feeling of defending country, defending family, defending the self, the whole thing, the whole thing going on. Yes. And I think that it, I think had he been from a different background, he probably would have joined much earlier and possibly, you know, after 9-11, he's this really athletic, passionate, intense guy. And I think it just didn't seem possible given his background and worldview, but that changed over time. He went to college, at a, at a little college next to the Naval Academy. And then he just was around, you know, you're right by DC. He just was around a lot of vets who just come out of being in Iraq and it became more like a normalized. It, be, it became more like seeming like a possibility, uh, something he could do. So he often says, you know, I kind of wish I, I joined much earlier, but he joined when he did. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, yeah, it was definitely a call Call to duty. And also he was curious about combat and seeing behind kind of the curtain of what actually is happening geopolitically. You know, it's interesting. We go to the same place every Friday night for pizza. <laughs> We're called Friday night, Carol, Friday okay. night, Tom. It's like, but if we don't do this, it's kind of like the whole week is off. So <laughs> we go in and one of the um, waiters who's really terrific said to us, um, I'm going to the Coast Guard next February. My brother and I are joining. And like my jaw dropped. Like I was like so surprised. And he wow. said, going in together. My father was in the Coast Guard. My grandfather was an admiral in the Coast Guard. And this is what we're going to do. And it just surprised me because I know he loves photography. I know he's a very artsy kind of person. And right. I was, if you're going to go to something that's so disciplined where art is not disciplined and he said, yes. And I probably I could be someplace where I could do photography as well. And it was just so interesting to hear how he was pulling the whole story together of what he hoped to do. And that's yeah, it's it's funny because everyone's like, so will Andrew write a memoir? Because I'm curious, because it's always that question of why did he join? Because I think people have this preconceived notions of 
who who a soldier is, an enlisted soldier, and who who his spouse is. Mm -hmm. And but it's really it is so much more complicated than that. And it, one thing I've really realized because I did not grow up, you know close to the military in any way is just that like people serve for so many different reasons mm -hmm. and there's such a cross section of humanity that's in the military it really is kind of like a microcosm of the united states mm -hmm. and um that's something that's been a kind of wonderful surprise about becoming part of this community and that's true of the women and the wives as well you know, this is leading right into, I'm saying the military is comprised for people from all over the country, <laughs> and people from different socioeconomic situations. You're going to be meeting up with people that are not necessarily like you. If you move to a town, a lot of people, even in one part of a town are like you and their values are mixed as well as their being from all over the country. What's it like to be thrust? I'm merely thrust because that's what ends up happening into a group of people who you very different from those you worked with, went to school with or anything. And you're all going to be together and you all are going to see values in each other. They're going to almost supersede the other values that don't see you the same. Am I on the right track? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think yes and no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, you, when I got there, you know, to Georgia, I had come from New York city. I had been an editor. I had, the furthest south I've been was Virgi Northern Virginia, I think, you know, it was really like a different world to me. Mm -hmm. And Andrew deployed two weeks later to Afghanistan. So I, I didn't even have a driver's license. So I was really kind of marooned in all the ways you can imagine. Um, and there was a wife across the street, Rachel, who I met uh, pretty immediately, actually very immediately. She <laughs> came to our door that, that very night and brought us cookies. And she was married to a guy in Andrew's unit who he'd gone through like all the trainings with. So he, they kind of come up together to become part of the unit and they both deployed and she drove us all together to the drop off for the deployment. And so we saw each other cry, but we knew nothing about each other really. Um, and it took about a week of, I was looking through my blinds and watching her do dishes and wondering who's going to make the first move. And she very bravely texted me and asked me to come for wine. And I was hesitant. You know, all I did know was uh, that she, they had gotten married very quickly and she was Christian. And that's all I knew. I didn't know all the, all these other things I came to know about her. And um, I just knew that, I mean, I had no idea who she was politically. I had no idea what her job had been. And so I think we both felt hesitant because you don't know socially kind of what you're walking into other than we're just married to guys in the unit. Um, so you really have to kind of fully introduce yourself. And I think, you know, that night we just talked and talked and had this really intimate conversation. And I think what was interesting is that we didn't really talk about those identifiers like what do you do for a living do you mm -hmm. want to have children you know we ended up talking about really I ended up telling her about what happened happened in couples therapy like mm -hmm. when Andrew said if it's you or the army mm -hmm. I mean we ended up talking about really intimate stuff that I would never talk to somebody about in a first meeting so I do think you're right that some of those things tend to fall away particularly when you're in these situations where your husbands are gone and then particularly when you're brand new and you're kind of like coming up in the ranks together as wives just as your husbands are coming up in ranks together at the same time there's this new set of social expectations that nobody really tells you about they're all unwritten but as i met other women beyond my friend rachel it became very clear to me, oh, I really like the first sergeant's wife, but she's not coming for dinner with her husband ever. <laughs> That's just not going to happen. You know, so at the same time, it's it's like there's it's a different set of externals and they matter. They don't matter, but they matter. They affect your friendship still. And that was like a huge learning curve for me. And I, especially because I was an older, I was 28 and my husband was brand new to the unit enlisted. And so really... I got, I, I got along with, with women who'd been there for a decade already, you know? So it was, yeah, it was a, <laughs> it was a learning curve for sure. And you, was, you were with their people who had been married at 18. You were with people who had been married at 21. Yeah, totally. They yeah. had that whole, you know, gap that you had like in between. It wasn't like that. You know, it's, um, many people think that deployment as a time when the spouses are away, oh, he's deployed. 
But I think that your book brings out how much other time people are away at training. Like all of a sudden you've got to go to jump out of the helicopter school at night. Like, <laughs> I know I made <laughs> up the name of the jump- sudden, It is your husband comes home and says, hey, I got to go to the school next week for yeah. four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. I'm so glad you brought that up because it's so hard to convey that. It's like, <laughs> No, he's not deploying, but he's still gone this next six months, you know, 50% of the time. It's so much. And it is more for sure in certain units like my husband's. It's not the same in every unit. But that was something that I didn't really understand going Mm -hmm. in until I got there. And and the women were just like, even when they're home, they're not really home. I remember one of the wives said that to me and it's like, what does that mean? (laughs) And she was just like, well, they're not deployed, but they're not friggin' here. Like, you know, they're sending them off to trainings or they're here, but they're training at night and sleeping on the floor of their office for a few hours. I mean, they have really grueling schedules. Yeah. And that is something that probably a lot of spouses can relate to in, uh, in other ways. But I think it's the uncertainty of it and the kind of suddenness of it that that you really have to learn to adapt to. Definitely. The one that really surprised me was we're going to go jump out of the helicopter tonight. Like we're going to go do this kind of training and somebody broke their leg. And he's like, I don't believe after all the time of jumping out of the helicopter, this is the time he breaks his leg. And you realize a hundred times he jumped out of plane (laughs) their plane. And yeah, and it was his hundredth jump, right? Like hundredth jump. And like, now this is what happens, but it also shows you how you have to be ready at any moment. And that requires training on an ongoing basis. And you also do talk about, and you're kind of washing out the first time he goes through training and sneaks out to, you know, say goodbye to you. And yeah. it's like, I'm going away for four more weeks. And you're just there like, you can picture the look <laughs> on your face of like, wait a second, whoa, 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 I'm doing the dishes alone again tonight. <laughs> like, yeah, ranger school is brutal. Yeah, yeah, that is a very tough one. I mean, and I think one reason I wanted to write this book about that time when he joined because you know he's still in it's been 12 13 years now and I would write a whole nother book about since I've had children and everything that's happened since Mm -hmm. Um, but I really wanted to show kind of the jarring quality of those years because not only are you new to everything not only are you learning a whole new language and just sort of way of being there's also just a lot in those first years because they're earning especially in my husband's unit their keep they're going to ranger school and so it's just kind of constant it's like deployment and the ranger school and you know it's sort of almost like if you're going to medical school and doing a residency and it's like those pressurized years mm-hmm. and so i really wanted to write about that time because it is such a pressurized time for for mm-hmm. that reason and yeah ranger school that was, I remember every, people talk about that scene and I think it's just because I remember that moment yeah. so well. And so I think I managed to write it pretty viscerally. Um, I totally yeah. expected him because he just, he, you know, he was the honor grad at boot camp. I was like, he's going to pass this first phase and he, he didn't. And then the way I couldn't even touch him, I couldn't, when I saw him, I couldn't hug him. You know, that was a real shock to the system at yeah. the time. That's yeah. not what you saw. That's not what you were signing up for. You were signing up for you're going to go, but you're going to come back on this date. And right. like the big thing, I also have to be incredibly naive about the amount of secrecy that surrounds everything that's going on. And at one point you talk about instructions to wives about re-entry for husbands, like they're going to come home and they might be <laughs> right. away in their brains for a couple of days. And it's like, you have a lot to share. Like, oh, and then I did this and oh, I did that. And he's yeah. still a little there. And yeah breaking it down and also trying to figure out how to get a redhead career wise, because he doesn't want to be private forever. He doesn't want to be this forever. What's the goal? What's no, the- that's a rough time. Nobody wants to be a private forever. Everybody wants to get out of that time. <laughs> and you were and, far behind that. Yeah. But, and you're uh, sitting there going, okay, you're thinking about how to get ahead in your career, but he was saying he was going to be the ad manager and then the director and then run the company. You understand. And now what you've got to learn this whole language about what's next oh and then what's from there can you make me a little chart so I know what's going on (laughs) I used to say that I'm like can I just have like a chart and also maybe like a schedule and he was like there's not really much of a schedule or he now is more privy to it but as I mean that's the other thing I kind of wanted to show was during that time when you're when they're new they're really kind of just put left in the dark about so Mm -hmm. many things and mm-hmm. so you really, when you are a newbie, it's like you are just so in the dark about everything. And I think that's one reason 
the wives are like such an important network because even if I could never have the first sergeant's wife over for dinner with my husband, we became friends and she was like my fount of information because she had access to so much more because her husband was running the company. Right. Uh, and so it's like this weirdly, I don't know, informal network of information that the women give each other through the mm -hmm. grapevine that the, before the army even steps in and tells us anything. Yeah. I was with somebody a couple of weeks ago. Um, her brother was being deployed and I said, where is he headed? So she says, well, he's with the New Jersey National Guard and he's going someplace and there are three places he could go. And we don't even go out to the airfield. And so we don't see who he's going with. And, was, and it was so, and that was before I'd read this book. And I was, wow. And she says, well, they don't want to say where he's going was Iraq, Syria, like wherever he's going to go, because then there'll be a flag. That that's where something could be happening. And we don't want yeah. anyone to know. And yeah. I think that we're in this world. And I thought about this reading this book of social media where TV commentators talking every night, pundits talking every night about what's going on in the world. And they're a group of people that really know what's happening in the world and they're not they're not able to share it. And the wives are the people that are like, they don't know either, but by the same token, they treasure what these guys are doing. They treasure their husbands and they want everything to happen. So it's a commitment on both sides is what I was seeing, but it's like, we don't know so much. And the chatter is like this all day long. And I was like, about what, you know? The chatter you mean on the news, essentially. You're right, exactly. Well, it's, and it's, I, that's something I really um, have a more nuanced understanding of now. You know, mm -hmm. I think I found, I, I get it. For one thing, I did try to uh, report when I was a journalist on veterans affairs and active, well, active duty was so hard to report on, it became more about veterans. But even the male veterans didn't want to talk to me. So I ended up, talking to women. And that's really how I got more access to that world. But I understood it's hard. The military doesn't want to be reported on or it wants to be reported on in a certain light because mm -hmm. optics are complicated. And so, you know, it's funny, my husband will complain, you know, he reads the New York Times every single day and he's like, oh, they're getting this wrong. They're getting this wrong. It drives him batty, you know, and it's also like, and I, and sure there's some fault there from the journalist, but at the same time, I'm like, well, this, <laughs> the military also makes it really hard to get to know what's happening. But it is a frustrating thing because you're right, there's so much chatter on social media and it is hard to know what's what. And even, mm -hmm. even if you are a fairly high ranking enlisted men or officer, there are levels of knowledge way above you. Mm -hmm. And you might have an idea of something that's going on, but you really might not. And I think, and that's one reason I think people don't always trust the military is because there are so many layers of secrecy and there are a lot of good reasons for that secrecy. And there are a lot of reasons that are not good or bad, but that we are not privy to mm -hmm. that are profoundly complex that I think can make for a sometimes dist distrustful public. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a complicated issue. For sure. Really, really complicated. Years yeah. ago, um, I met Chris Whitcomb, who had written a book about being in the FBI. I can't remember the mm -hmm. name of it now. It was a really terrific book. And when he got out, he was doing a lot of missions. Like he would fly over on a Halliburton plane to go do something and just take a guy out in Iraq. Like he was like a leader or something like that. Right. And they were actually brought in just to do this one mission. And he says, you're on the plane and you don't know who you're on the plane with. Like, are they from the FBI or who, who is it? Right. Yeah. 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 Andrew was saying that too. <laughs> you open your eyes. You open your eyes so much more. And well, he's really funny because he said, okay, let's say you're a private. So let's say you're a captain. Let's say you're this. You have this level of knowledge. And he says, the FBI knows this, but the CIA knows this, but there are four levels or eight levels in the CIA. And are you on the same level to have a conversation? And he said, when you sit there and realize to have a conversation, even with each other, what it's like, imagine like trying to be the yeah. wife back that's there. That's so fascinating. Yes, that's so true. And all those rules I was talking about, you know, they apply tenfold to, to the guys in the unit. And, mm -hmm. and that's something I really had to also just like in the writing of the book, really respect and understand. I mean, my husband read four drafts of this book and it was really, and it was an interesting experience because mm -hmm. I came to understand the meaning of all kinds of things, like what's truly OPSEC and what's not operational security, but also he was kind of forced to articulate 
more of his emotional reality to me in ways that he hadn't, mm -hmm. um, especially why he joined. And I feel like, and then also he was getting to experience my emotional reality in, you know, in ways he'd only gotten glimpses of. And so that was a really, it's like he read it for a lot of reasons. He's a reader. He actually was a great editor, even though I didn't always want to take his edits. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but, but also to make sure that I was doing I was doing my job safely, essentially. And, but it was also this kind of, um, I don't know, it was almost like couples counseling. It was almost like we were getting to know each other anew in ways yes. that we hadn't anticipated. So it was actually this really rich experience going yeah. through together. It was so funny because I knew you'd done couples counseling, which I thought was such a great idea. It's so many points in your life to have just gone out and do that even before you got married. You know, just yeah, to, yeah. Just, we wouldn't have if he had not been thinking about joining the army. I mean, just like <laughs> wouldn't have occurred to us, but it was like this intractable thing. And we're and I was like, I think we need to talk about. It. I mean, I think we both decided we need to we need a mediator because right. I was I was really against it in the beginning. You know, it's, it's, I was that not, <laughs> you didn't want it to happen. <laughs> I know, I think it doesn't go through. No, I mean, I was really not on board and I think I thought he could be convinced otherwise, or I think he, he would get, get it out of his system eventually. And, um, I wanted to marry him. And I said, and so I, I said, yes, but there's this elephant in the room. Yeah. And, and eventually that's how we ended up at couples counseling that that first time. But it was a really good idea beyond that, because we'd been together for four years. There's lots of stuff that I think couples can sort out in couples counseling. And I'm really, really glad. We kind of had this, like, I think the what we went through or like what we negotiated in that first couples counseling was, it was particular to our situation. At the same time, there was like a universal kind of complex navigating of like, does what we're going to do with our lives and like our desires and our passions and how are we going to make this work? Mm -hmm. Because once I was on board, I mean, that was the next conversation. It was like, okay, I'm going to leave my job as an editor. How are we going to make this work? How are you going to support my career? How am I going to support your career? And I think those are conversations that probably people don't end up having that much at the beginning of marriage, but they absolutely become very important. And when, what does he do? He brings in a desk and he brings in a desk so you can write. And there's yeah. that moment that you realize, you know, it was a tactile kind of thing that he's bringing in something to support you. He's, he's setting yeah. you up to do what you want to do. And it's up to you to take it from there, but you now have the desk. <laughs> I love that. I know, like, I know, I that was a, it was a beautiful symbolic moment, certainly that he went out to Walmart. We were so broke and he got the $30 desk and <laughs> Put it together and there it was you know in our fake christmas morning before he deployed right. and yeah it was i mean he has always supported me in that way and it also was kind of it is true that when i left my job as an editor i got more time to write and it, it i think you know there were a lot of things about him joining that i didn't didn't love the idea of and there have been a lot of challenges and at the same time, I've had some flexibility that has allowed me to write. And I don't know, I mean, I certainly wouldn't have written this book, but I, you know, I don't know if I would have gone down that path in part because he just so believed in me. It was like, it forced me to kind of jump off the deep end a little bit mm -hmm. and, and say, okay, I mean, I still was an editor after that, but not like a New York City, I'm working all hours. It's, it's impossible. It's very hard to juggle writing and editing in that, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So it was an opportunity. I mean, in disguise in many yeah. ways. You don't see it coming. You're like, wait, oh wait, here at the desk. Okay. Which I think is very like army life. I mean, you kind of, you just, you can look at it like you can kick and scream. And honestly, I totally support that because sometimes you need to kick and scream. And sometimes yeah. the army does really angering things at the yes. same time. Like you can also look at, look at most things as an, many things as an opportunity because you're inviting new people into your life and new places into your life. You are expanding who you are. I mean, my time in Georgia changed me like fundamentally mm -hmm. and in ways that I think are really, really positive. Ultimately, mm -hmm. um, I'm much more, I understand the importance of communities so much more now. I, I feel like that's really what I brought from my time in Georgia was 
I will just, I know all my neighbors, like, and we are, you know, it's like, I have a diverse group of friends here and that's because I've put myself out there, which wasn't natural to me because I'd never had to really forge community with a group of people who are radically different from me before. Mm -hmm. And that was good for me. I mean, it was good to be marooned and have to hang out with somebody I'd never met before in their house, uh, drinking wine and having intimate conversation. That was a, that was a broadening experience in every way. And I just love the way you like text each other. Come on over. I'm on my way. You know, I'm going to do this. I'm there for you. you know? Even yeah, you know, it became, yeah, it became very, you know, later in the book, right? My my phone, my Maps app is recognizing her house as home. Yes. Over there so much during that, that, that deployment when I was pregnant. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you also capture the fear of getting the call when your spouse is deployed. Like when the phone rings, you don't look at the phone the same way. Are you getting the red call? Are you getting, and the person who's in charge of making the calls, did you hear from them? Did you hear from them? And immediately you're all on with each other of like, what did you hear? What's going on? And I found it was really interesting because the one thing you want to make sure is that there's nobody standing outside your home, like ready to come in. And that didn't happen to anybody that I remember during the book, like in this unit, which was amazing, though they were with, deployed with people that have been hurt. And there were some people in their unit that have been hurt. But that moment of, I don't know what's really what's going on. I don't know where he is. And I get a very brief conversation and he has to get off and you hear tension in his voice. And I feel you did a really good job of bringing in. It's not all these love letters, like in World War II. <laughs> it's not like any... It's very difficult to have those kind of conversations. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I think that sometimes historically we put a bit of a romantic lens on on this idea of being apart. And there is that aspect. There is the joy of reunion. There is the distance makes the heart grow fonder and all that. But there is also a huge strain of distance and not being able to say what you want to say on the phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that, and I think that was, that was another thing I really kind of wanted to show with this book because it's hard in a different way now, but we're, we've also learned to navigate it so much better. Mm -hmm. And that's something you really deliberately, like when your husband leaves as much as mine, do you really have to be deliberate about how you come together and leave and how you stay connected when you're apart. But we had no idea what we were doing in the beginning and no one was really telling us what, how to do it. And I think it was hard. It was very hard on our new marriage because of that, because he was learning how to go back and forth from pretty harrowing situations to how's the pregnancy going? How's Rachel doing? What'd you have for dinner? You know? And I think that's hard, obviously. Right. And I was be I was suffering from really intense anxiety at times and really afraid and also being given the message, you know, put on a brave face, don't fill their head with any worries from home. And I, you know, he never gave me that message, but it certainly was just a feeling. It was a, it was this general message that like, you don't want to burden them. They got enough going on. And so, you know, usually your spouse, like the person you want to share everything with, you can't. And then you're also living really radically separate lives. And yet you're going through this parallel experience together. Mm -hmm. and I think it's something like reading the book, you know, him reading the book, it was sort of like those parallel experiences were finally kind of the paths were merging. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're together long enough, those paths will merge. And it's this really kind of beautiful experience because you've been one thing about marriage that's wonderful is that you share everything. One thing that uh, about marriage that's terrible is that you share everything. <laughs> you right, know? Right. <laughs> and, you know, what I've heard about love in general and Eros and what is her name? Esther Perel. She was saying, you know, if you want to reignite love, it's like go out and have new experiences. And sometimes I feel like we got to kind of, after all this time, we've gotten to touch each other's experiences a little bit. Um, that's a good way to do it. That's good. But it I feel like I'm kind of zooming ahead in the book, but it is, yeah, it's still really hard. And it's, it is, there's a lot of those conversations are very awkward mm -hmm. and they're almost like being on a blind date, except with your husband. <laughs> you know, there, actually, let me bring me right to what I was going to read from the book. Wait a second, I'm going to put down a page over here. Hold on a second. So we can do this. Many of the wives knew just the barest facts about their husband's jobs. They loved their husbands. They knew their husbands or the essence of their husbands, at least. They just didn't exactly understand their husbands. I thought I understood Andrew, 
but I was less sure of this now than ever. Maybe with each passing year, I knew him a little more and understood him a little less. The army was changing him, making the soft parts of him hard, the warm part ones cool to the, uh, to the touch. But then again, they're also, I'm just trying to because it's like dark, <laughs> they're also that sort of person to begin with. Was I just unwilling to understand who my husband really was? And I thought that was just such a great passage. I mean, I flagged a number of pages, but that one that I read and I said, yeah, like, who is this guy? And was that really him all along? Yeah, it was very, it was beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I thought uh, that line, right? I feel like maybe I know him a little more and understand him a little less. I thought that maybe, you know, I've only ever been married to him, but I thought that maybe there was something kind of universal in that in marriage because mm -hmm. we we think we know the person right but yes. there's a lot we don't and also we change and so it's kind of like I think on some level we do come to know them better but that means things we thought we understood about who they were get upended and that narrative gets kind of thrown on its side and I'll, that is definitely something I really wanted to investigate in the book because it's something yeah I, I struggled with because he is a complicated guy who has a lot of different aspects and compartments within him and um and I I think the army was sort of like both highlighting something that was already there and also changing it mm -hmm. and changing, you know and changing him and then changing me at the same time like it was such a pressure cooker experience in those first years, especially that it fundamentally was changing both of us. It was kind of like getting to know each other in this new environment, you know, right. it was every, every new thing you can imagine <laughs> kind of thrown together at once. And with some rules that you didn't really know, but you had to come to learn. Like the, with the social <laughs> yeah, rules. exactly. New rules, but no one's going to tell you what they are. Yeah, exactly. But the book also has humorous moments. And I think that one of the funniest okay. was, and you know what I'm going to say, you in the church nursery with all oh, the good. children <laughs> goes in. And I feel like I shouldn't even give this one away, but it was so funny that person no, doesn't I show up to help. And all of a sudden you have all the children and you're like, where are these children all coming from? And the person uh, my best friend read that and she was like, this is so uniquely you that you would just been like, okay, I guess I'm the, the caregiver and I'll just watch all 12 of these kids. And I'm like, you wouldn't do that? And she's like, no, I would have found someone. I, I would have been like, what is going on? <laughs> so, oh yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, so, you know, as I said, Rachel is Christian. Her faith is really important to her. She goes to church every week and um, I grew up without religion. And I, I've always been curious about religion. I've always been even maybe a bit jealous of people who had religion. And yet the churches in Georgia were not something I wanted to join. And even the ones she had joined had, there were really, there were evangelic, evangelical aspects of it that she wasn't totally on board with. Mm -hmm. Um and so, you know, I went to her church a little, feeling a little wary, but she said, will you come and, and watch my my toddler while I sing with a choir? Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't going to the services, but so I was happy to watch her kid um, while she did that. And it was really just going to be 45 minutes while she practiced. And I, and I did that many times after that scene in the book. <laughs> But fortunately, it was only that one time that I get there, I'm watching her, and then all these these moms just come in and keep dropping off children. And they just drop the kid off and walk away. And suddenly I had, yeah, I had, I don't know, 10 kids that I was watching. And I kept being like, okay, the nursery caregiver is going to be here any minute. <laughs> Never came. So somehow I kept all those kids alive. And that was when I was really pregnant. And I just remember feeling so out of my depth and being like, how am I going to have a baby? Because I was changing diapers. I was watching, you know, her baby eat raisins and wondering if, he, if she was going to choke on them. And I just thought there are a million reasons. Any of these kids could just not survive this next hour. <laughs> and I don't know how mothers do this. So it was probably some good practice at the time. Good practice, but I just love the boat where she was, where she was. <laughs> Weird, the nurse or caregiver didn't show up, and you're like, "Oh, is that was?" And then she cracked up so hard. I know that was, yeah. She was. I will never live that moment down. <laughs> That's exactly. But you know, <laughs> waiting, 
waiting is such a huge theme in the book, like waiting for the caregiver. But waiting is a theme that happens throughout the book. And have you gotten better about when he's gone waiting? Has it, as time has gone on, you know, is it, does it change or yeah. some kind of positions you sort of know it's a little bit better? It's, it's a good question. And it's something that, you know, a wife says to me in the book, I, it, you know, I'd asked her in the week when I got there, does it ever get easier? And she said, well, you get used to it, but it never gets easier. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is accurate. I have, I have so many more tools at my disposal. I have more resources now, both just like financially and in terms of community than when I first got to Georgia. Um, and so I know how to kind of plan for times of waiting. Mm -hmm. Now, is it also a, just a different quality of waiting because I have kids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's different because for instance, when he got deployed unexpectedly during COVID lockdown, that was, you know, how do you plan for that? Right. right. So with kids, especially, there were so many of my supports that just suddenly weren't there. And so there are, as the world changes, the challenges change mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. as the nature of conflicts change. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's never the same and you're having to adapt constantly. Um, at the same time, having kids, it's harder in many ways. And as they get older, it's absolutely heartrending sometimes to watch, you know, my seven-year-old really struggle with it in a new way right now. Uh, but they're also really grounding. So, you know, I think some of the anxieties I experienced, particularly when I was pregnant during that extended deployment, I don't know that they would be the same now because kids just force you to stay right. in the moment. Like you cannot do the catastrophic thinking thing to the right. same extent. And so I think that kids in some ways have made it emotionally easier, but I'm more exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> That's <Probably. exciting. laughs> <laughs> These questions are flying one to the other because I was going to say, is it easier when Andrew's away because you have company, you have you have two people, but you have two people you're in charge of. It's not two yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. Out with. <laughs> and it's and when, and when I say easier emotionally, it's different emotionally. It's less about me. Mm -hmm. I worry yeah. more about my kids and and the effect on them and and the challenges for them, and less about myself, which I think is probably the thing a lot of mothers do and probably not ideal. So I do go to therapy every week <laughs> and that's kind of where, where it gets to be about me. But most of the time I'm, I'm thinking about my kids these days. I think, you know, therapy comes up a number of times in the book. And I think it is so great that you realize that you need that third person to be having the conversations with you about what to do. And instead of you two sort of doing this, it's somebody else saying, here's how you can go together. Here's how you can. And I think that, you know, bringing that up again and again in the book is such a good thing for people to see of, you don't have to be alone. You can bring somebody on to help you. You can bring somebody from the outside to help you. And even the one doctor, the one um, OBGYN that we really loved and you really want him to like sit and have an opinion when you get in another situation of, I, I, this is a person I trust. And so you make a, build the support system within the book of the other wives and then beyond that, what you needed to do. And yeah, I mean, I think that's the other thing that I have found um, is that when you're an anger in your family leaves so often, you lose something, obviously. But it also kind of is like it leaves this door open for other people people to come in across, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. across your threshold. So I feel like my kids have more people who love them. I feel like I have friends even outside of the military now who appreciate what I experienced and will call me and say like, Hey, do you want me to take your kids or pick them up today or do a little craft with your daughter at my house or just anything they're thinking of me, which I, I think I used to feel. And I think a lot of military spouses feel that civilians don't get mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and they don't reach out and there's this divide and I think that divide is really real but mm -hmm. I also have found the more open I am about what my life is really like with my civilian friends the more they show up and the mm -hmm. more that you know we have this community and um it's it's been kind of like that's been I think the real like gift of this life I think sometimes when you have your nuclear family together all the time. That's an amazing gift. 
but you also don't end up kind of letting as much of community and love in and you get very caught up in kind of your your own little insular family. I would totally agree. And, you know, the book is set during your time in Columbus, Georgia, not Columbus, Ohio. It's Columbus, Georgia. I know that, yeah. No, everyone's always like, what? Columbus, no, where? Where's where Columbus, Alabama? Georgia is, basically, unless you're from there. But it's right it's right by Alabama. Right, right by Alabama. And it's interesting because then you move to Tacoma at the end of the book. But in Columbus, it feels like everybody's very close to each other. And it was, you were living across the street. I mean, you were living across the street. You had somebody, like, in the neighborhood. Everybody was doing the same thing. And I know that in the um, book, you say that in Tacoma, the base is about 30 minutes away. Do you think it would have been more difficult to start out and, you know, get your, your, your feet wet in the army, <laughs> feet wet mm -hmm. as an army wife in Tacoma than it would have been if you were in Columbus? Because in Columbus, everybody feels like it was like an in and out kind of a thing. That's such a good question. And it's funny because we had a few choices for where we could end up and Columbus was at the bottom of the list and mm -hmm. that is where we wound up. And mm -hmm. I think it would have been different. You know, I think the thing about Columbus was, I mean, some people were in Phoenix City, right, which was in Alabama. And the base was maybe 15 minutes from our house or so. It was pretty, it was pretty close. But I think one of the things, one of the reasons that community was so close, there's a couple of things. We were still, when we got there, we were still on a very, you know, kind of quick deployment tempo mm -hmm. and I think when you're when you're really actively in a war mm -hmm. there's something about that that brings the unit closer and then also there's not that much to do and so I think people would there are more friendships because of that and there are more people having families so here what we've noticed is there are it is more spread out because there's a base and then there's a lot of little cities around it and then you also have seattle and so people aren't having families as quickly people are you know going out to concerts in seattle like there's just more to do and so their lives are a little bit bigger and broader and so i think your life, my life in Columbus was more insular, mm -hmm. which helped me get through in ways. And at the same time, that can really increase the pressure cooker feeling. You know, I talk about that, like, yeah. who do you lean on when everybody's going through the same thing? Or there's, mm -hmm. there's a time when everyone's so stressed out or so freaked out, like during that deployment extension, yes. and they were going on this big historic mission, that it's almost like you can't, nobody can be there for each other because they're just getting through and they're just trying to get food on the table for their kids and not fall apart. And so there were times that probably having a broader community, like Rachel had her church community and I saw what that gave her. It was like this breath. It was like this breathing room outside of the community. And there were times it probably would have been really healthy for me to have that. And I, and I did have bits and pieces of it, I, this didn't make it into the book, but I taught an after school program and that was like a really, you know, helpful grounding thing at the time. So I think, I don't know, it just would have been, it would have been different and there would have been pluses and minuses. I don't know that I would have had such close mm -hmm. friendships, but I might've gotten like a regular job immediately instead of working as a freelance editor and writing. And that would have changed my career path and mm -hmm. it's hard to say. Yeah. Honestly. It would be different about writing this book because the book is about the community of the wives it's yes, really about exactly. I wouldn't have written this book let's just say that much I wouldn't have written this book you would have written this Probably. book you know and I feel that um now you're going to be there for the rest of his service or could you still have another move like how many um, moves do you have or have you chosen we don't know I will probably move yeah it's really it's uh there's a lot of things that are up in the air at the moment mm -hmm. so we will see but we will probably move and We'll see what happens. Yeah. There's a there's a lot of classified information in this small girl. Don't come back. There's a lot of classified information right now. Even no, it's themselves. true. It's <laughs> truly. I don't know. I mean, that is the, that is the reality. It is a life defined by uncertainty. I, it, it, your life can change almost on a dime, mm -hmm. and one hopes that it doesn't, and it generally doesn't, but it can. I mean, we could get news that in six months we're moving somewhere, mm -hmm. um, and and I've seen that happen to many people. So. I don't have a good answer. I do love where we are though. And it's, it feels like home. Yes. It's been a good experience because you've been there for almost seven years. I mean, that's like a yeah. time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's also, while well, there's not a lot of an active war right now. There's not an active war. There's a lot going on overseas, yeah. military wise, et cetera. There's like what I heard that, you know, they were sending people to these couple of countries. You realize now there was for a reason and you saw how things are, you know, sort of imploding. 
but it's different from the days of about Afghanistan and Iraq where it was on the news every night and it was in people's minds. And I mm -hmm. think that there's not, there, the recognition of military service during peacetime is not the same as it is during wartime. And I think that the sacrifice of the families becomes the same because you still don't know what will happen at any moment. And I just felt reading this, it's like, well, if everything's okay now, like, are we worried about this still? And yeah, you are. And you're really reading. The yeah. Book and it's still a reality. I mean, my husband still deploys and so, and it's, it's, that's, I think something that, you know, the military is engaged in a lot of places for a lot of reasons and certain units are engaged more than others. And that is something I really, I wanted to come through because I think people feel like, oh, it's over now. Mm -hmm. And um, for so many families, including, you know, families I know who are reserves and their spouse has never deployed, their spouse is suddenly leaving for a year and they have five and six-year-olds who've never experienced absences. Mm -hmm. And so there's, and that's a really extreme version, but it's, I mean, I have good friends, it's happening to right now. And um, so it's something I really want people to know that it's not, you're not just living with the uncertainty, you, we are living with a reality. Deployments don't stop, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, and they're not to the extent that they were, but they're still very much a reality and they can happen no notice and they can happen for lots of reasons. If you get no notice, is it like tomorrow you're going or in a week you're going? Is can it? But what's the anything? It depends. <laughs> really? Yeah, okay. It's, it's one of those things. It depends, and it depends on the unit, and it depends. And no notice is a is maybe not the right phrase, but they can happen. I'll just say short notice. They yeah. can happen short notice certainly, and that's so that's something that military families are either contending with the possibility of it or the reality of it. And often they can't talk about it publicly, mm -hmm. even if it's happening. Mm -hmm. And they, and that is a real um, hardship to, mm -hmm. to kind of put on a face that is not what you're living at home. Mm -hmm. It's not what your kids are living at home. And so that's what the other wives were seeing either. You know, I remember um, Chris Wickham also saying one time to me, he says, um, I pull up to the book baseball field and I have all my gear in the back of the truck because I could go wheels up like that. I could be, you've got to get, you know, to the base and we're going. And you didn't know that was what you're going to do today. So you always carry everything with you just in case. And I thought, like, you're walking your kids on third base and you go, I'll be back, but you don't know when. And I said, yeah, but that's reality, you know? Wow. Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I talk about in the book is that I, I sort of romanticize, quote unquote, normal family life, whatever that means, because mm -hmm. there are a million ways that family life look, you know, but I... I do think there are moments that I just, um, that military families yearn for are really just sort of, yeah, a feeling of normalcy of knowing like we're going to have dinner together every night. Mm -hmm. And, and more than that, I mean, my, what my husband really yearns for is like, I want to be able to commit to taking my kid to t-ball practice. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to commit to, you know, seeing my kids dance recital and, but he can't. And I think like that's a real hardship for for soldiers that people don't don't necessarily maybe think about. Mm -mm. No, no, and I, I can say you, you don't. So yeah. now you're going to write this book. Did you said you say it's a tale one day. I say I'm going to write a book. Was it a short story first? Did you outline what you were going to do? Where did this all start? I would say that it started the idea for the book started when I published a piece so we had just moved here and to Tacoma Washington I had a had my little baby and I wasn't writing much oh <laughs> because you know my husband <laughs> continued to be gone a whole bunch and I didn't know anybody right. and I would just and she my baby she was lovely, but she didn't sleep. So I would just walk and walk and walk and walk and get her to sleep in this little carrier. And then I started writing on my phone and I wrote this essay on my phone and it ended up getting published in the New York times. And this was really about, I, it really, I think read ultimately as a tribute to the wives because mm -hmm. I was thinking so much about these women in part because I was a mother now. And so I was appreciating the experience appreciating and understanding the experience like what they had been living when I was living in Georgia with them that you know in a new way because I was finally experiencing it myself and after that piece was published I that made me realize oh you know people actually are 
care and are interested and 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 want to hear about these women. And it also, I think, being away from them just was making me value them in a new way and understand that this community is comprised of like, such, like the toughest people I've ever known, mm -hmm. you know? And I think I was so embedded in, it in Georgia that was hard to see, but I came here and I was like, dang, those ladies are tough, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I was sort of newly, especially because I was a mom, you know, I was newly impressed with that toughness. And, and I wanted the world to know about that because I feel like really our job is to be kind of invisible and silent and uh, to protect our, you know, our husbands and not let, not let on where they are, when they're coming home, what they do for a living. And I mean, so that was a, definitely an inspiration. I mean, seeing that, that there was a readership, I guess, mm -hmm. but I, I think I was also just sort of working towards this book unconsciously for years, ever since Andrew joined, uh, because I was writing essays about the experience to just make sense of it because mm -hmm. it such a jarring and world expanding, but also crushing, but also changing, you know, experience and such a identity upending experience moving from New York City to Georgia that I couldn't not write about it, even though there were so many, you know, privacy issues to navigate while doing so. Um, and so once I started to sit down and really write the proposal for it, which was crazy because I had an editing business. I had a two-year-old and I had a newborn mm -hmm. and Andrew was deployed four times in four years. You know I mean? It was like, it was a lot. And, but I, I think there was something about having children that made me realize if I don't start writing books now, this isn't going to happen for mm -hmm. me. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I would drop my baby off. I remember the YMCA drop-in daycare where you're yes. supposed to work out, but I would just go sit in the lobby and I would work on this proposal yes. slowly, but surely. And I, I don't mean, I probably spent two years just on the proposal. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I realized that everything I've been writing, like there's very little of any of those essays actually in the book, but all of that writing had kind of been the the groundwork I'd been laying to write this book, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and I was ready to write it. And I, and I just had to, basically. Yeah, the piece in the Times was great. <laughs> I went back and read it this week. The piece in the Times was really terrific. Which one? The... It was uh, the modern love one. The oh modern yeah, love that, well, that's more recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Modern, oh, was that more recent? Okay, that wasn't the older one. Yeah, okay. that came out a few weeks ago. So oh, okay. the, the first one I published was in Ties, which is gone now, but it was a column about family. Uh -huh. And it, and it really, the piece was about coming here to Washington and feeling very like, where do I belong now? Mm -hmm. You know, I'd gone to Georgia and felt like a stranger in a strange land. And I thought that coming back to the West Coast where I'd grown up, not the exact area, but you know, NPR playing, you know, in people's cars, basically similar vibes to the Bay Area. I thought it would feel like home or at least really familiar. I, you know, because there were a lot of challenges when I got to Georgia, just in terms of everyday conversation mm -hmm. with people, mm -hmm. because we had such different life experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I got here and I, the piece was about going to story hour at the library with my baby and looking for friends and looking for community because I was alone again and feeling yet again, like I was yelling across the deck in a storm. You know, that's something I say about talking to one of my friends the first time we have a conversation, just yeah. feeling like it's not computing and feeling like, am I going to be an outsider or wherever I end up? And I don't feel like that now, but it was that, that piece was really about that and about missing those women that I, that I'd left behind. Yeah. It was interesting because you also become friends with the parents of your children, like your, yeah. the, the, the other parents. So wherever you go, it's like, you go to a birthday party with those people. It's like, they're in yeah. that class. They're in this, yeah. that becomes your nucleus for like the longest time. And I ran into a mom a couple of years ago, at yoga class. And she said to me, are you still married? And I was like, what do you know that I don't know? <laughs> so I said, yes. <laughs> like tentatively. I think. Hi, yeah, yes. Right. Uh, do, you have, do you have news for me? I and she's, yeah, well, a lot of people got divorced when the kids became teenagers. Yeah. And it's, can we go out to dinner? And I just thought this was like this crazy oh, conversation wow. to be having. But you know what? It was a lot of people, their lives had gone like this. They had all like, you know, not stayed in the same places. And it was interesting. 
Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, in the book, I think that that's something I kind of try to highlight as well is that there is a way that we get to, you're married and you're very dependent in certain ways. You're waiting, as you said, for those phone calls and you're waiting for news to, to come down about when they're getting home. And you're waiting for the possibility of a notification officer to show up at your door and how terrifying that is. Uh, at the same time, you're totally independent and you can almost imagine that you're single, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, because you're, you're not, but you're running a house on your own and you have a lot of like freedom, everyday freedoms you, you might not have otherwise. Right. And so you are your social world. Like I got to hang out with these women so much in ways that I think a lot of younger married couples might not get that time you know right. like I really got a lot of female friendship time mm -hmm. and I looking back that was really really special and it and I would feel the loss of it when my husband came home mm -hmm. I was so happy he came home but everybody would kind of hibernate like oh <laughs> you knew the husbands were back because you would people would stop knocking at your door or calling you or you know there would be less gatherings or drinks or parties or any of that because everybody was reuniting with their husbands and that was important but I think just as the men sometimes felt a loss coming home and losing the intimacy that they had with like their guys and bond how how much they bonded overseas i think we felt that too like we yeah. we missed the intensity of that intimacy and how much time we spent together you know that was kind of like you don't really get that other than in maybe college you know and and people talk about how it's harder to make friends as we get older and part of that's just because you don't have that time that that like that shared huge blocks of time I remember the night before I graduated from college, I stood there and I said, I will never again be in a place where all my friends are like, you have a no shoes relationship because you could just walk <laughs> down the hall. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no shoes, shoes, no socks okay. relationship. And right. Just, like it was like a pajama relationship. Or, like, Show up in your pajamas. Right. Right. And you could just get on the floor, go down to the third floor, go to the sixth floor, go see, and it was not never going to be like that again. And I think that's that kind of moment. And mm -hmm. for you, that's you beautiful. also started the book club which was a little bit of discussion about the book. Some people had read the book, but it was a reason for everybody to get together. And yeah. Yeah. it becomes just as important to get together. And I'm lucky right now, I'm in a book club, which sounds like well, your book club, so there was no judgment. Like everybody just shows up. <laughs> it sure was no judgment. Yeah, exactly. I didn't read the book. Like I just didn't get to it. Or I just didn't like the book. Some say I hated the book. But we'll mm -hmm. do the discussion of the book. But then the kind of the coolest thing happened the other night. One of the women said, I told my daughter that I bring it to the hive of an issue that she's having with these kids at school. And I want to see what you guys say. And okay. I thought, man, you're is, the hive. We're, we're in the hive. The book club's okay. the hive and we're going to be the ones. What would you do in this situation? And I thought so women are all younger than I am. And I love hearing the stories of their kids and hear what people are going through these days. We always have book club at my house because I have no kids. So I don't know if anybody's going to come okay, in and go, mom, put me to yeah. bed. Like, I don't yeah. care. It's, it's, you have kids. They're just not there. They're oh, just, yeah. they're like, you know, 29, 34. <laughs> they're like much older. They're not going to care about book club. So, um, but it's really interesting because we'll sit down and we'll have these big conversations at the same time as we're talking about a book and the book can lead to these other conversations or we know so-and-so is not going to like the book. But I thought that when you did that and said, let's do a book club and it was going to be something, it was something you knew and it's something that it was a great way to bring people together. Yeah, that's a, it, it was, it was a really fun way to bring people together and that people were really, really game. I mean, that's another thing I will say about, about the wives is they were always game. They're like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> Whatever it was, you know, and whether they're able to read the book or not, they will show up and they will prepare some food or make some cookies or make a casserole. Like they, they will show up. That's, that's one thing I really learned about these women and valued about these women. Um, and also, you know, I think, the one thing that I, I don't know, I wanted to show in the book is also that I really struggled with that kind of divide between the identity I had before I got to Georgia. And then I get there and I'm a wife, you know, and mm -hmm. there's power in being a wife in certain ways. And there's diminishment in being a wife, but it, at the end of the day, it's reductive because it's not your whole identity. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with that a little bit because, especially because every most everyone I knew had children. Mm -hmm. And so in New York, the question had always been, what do you do for a living? And so much so that I got tired of it. 
And then I got to Georgia and nobody asked. It was sort of, you know, where are your kids? When are you having kids? Why don't you have kids? <laughs> 28. You know, it was very mysterious that I didn't have any children yet in that in my new community. And so it was as time went on, people, my friends came to know me also as a writer and an editor and a lover of books. And I think that that book club was a really meaningful thing to me because you know, it started out of like, oh, I miss having a writing group. I had had one in New York. And Andrew was like, well, you know, I don't, I mean, you can't have that with these women, but you could have a book club. Some of them are big readers. And it was such a great idea because it was, it felt a, like a way for me to kind of fuse those identities. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of the book is about trying to figure out how to integrate myself fully into this world and still and be like my whole self essentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how can I be me and still be there how can I be me yeah, how can, right which I there are times I mean and there are times that I absolutely lost myself and struggled with that mm -hmm. hugely for sure but I think that happens in outside world too but sometimes yeah. people don't admit it I think that's the big thing is a lot of times people don't admit what's going on and everything's perfect I say everything's perfect till you're 40 that's my joke <laughs> Everything's perfect. And the best, all job, by it. best job was ever. And then all of a sudden, 40, you go, I'm not so sure about that. That's still cool, but I don't think it's the way it's happening. You know, really. That's interesting. I mean, I do think that that is one aspect of it is that there's not, you can't, it's hard to pretend that everything's perfect in this life because yeah. there's such challenges and life or death circumstances being thrown at you. And that can rush you toward divorce. I mean, mm -hmm. that can really, that can break a couple mm -hmm. or it can be an opportunity to be really conscious about dealing with your stuff so that you don't wake up at 43 and look at everything and say, oh, everything's not great channels, you know <laughs> essentially so it's it's it can be an opportunity it can also be a real hardship you know one wife did leave if i remember correctly one wife did leave earlier in the book like early in the book she was yeah uh, and she left with two children if i remember correctly <laughs> uh one child, one child. Okay. And, um yes the mira character i mean all these are not their real names so right, i'm trying right, to right. say their real names um Yes, she left early on and I didn't get a ton of time to know her. And um, her husband definitely had some issues with PTSD, um, among other things that made her marriage untenable. Mm -hmm. And that is something um, that, you know, I see more and more. Mm -hmm. Again, this book were those beginning years. And so I'm not showing a lot of things like divorce. I'm showing couples kind of, going through those years when they're younger couples with younger kids and what that looks like with the background of, of war and being sent to war over and over again. And, and it's strained some of those marriages and not, I mean, not all the marriages in the, most of the marriages in the book are still together. Not all of them are, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something where I'm going to be 40 in June. So yeah. Call me in a few months and <laughs> you know I'm doing. But I um, but it's like you know, it's something that I'm starting to see is mm -hmm. that a, it. Andrew was saying the other day he was on a training and he was watching a sergeant major, and he was sergeant major was speaking about you know watching a. They'll just kind of nonchalantly talk about things like watching a friend getting shot in the face. I mean, very intense mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. We're kind of make it into their conversation or when they're giving a speech, but it's also not nonchalant. It might seem nonchalant, but it, they're also driving a point home. Like it's when they're kind of saying, get it together, man, because like shit right. is real out there basically, you know, but he was, he was saying, I was watching him and I was watching his body and the way he was speaking. And I thought of Tim O'Brien and I thought, man, the things they carried is the phrase, like, because mm -hmm. you could feel it mm -hmm. you feel it in his whole body the th I mean and when I say sergeant major this is someone who's probably deployed 16 17 times he has lost good friends like he mm -hmm. is in really pretty terrible things like it's and he was just talking about how you know you could really feel the things they carried in this sort of bodily way in his body and he was saying that phrase was so perfect and I thought I, it's true in the families and the marriages, like we carry these experiences. It's a, it's a family wide experience. Really. It's not just, 
an experience, an isolated experience that happens in combat. And it, it has so many reverberations mm -hmm. and it's a load. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a real and true load that, that whole families carry together. And sometimes that load breaks them. And that's something I am seeing in a real way now that I didn't experience in those years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. That's a reality. Yeah. People were, you know, coming at a different time. So how close is the book to that original proposal that you wrote? Did you follow a chapter and verse or did, as you started writing, I can do this a different way. I can say this in a different way. What ended up happening? Yeah, that's a good question because writing a uh, proposal is really artificial. It's a really odd way <laughs> to yeah. start a book, but it's not an uncommon way to sell a memoir these days, especially one that's topical. So it, it, it was kind of the advice I'd gotten from, from people I talked to and agents I talked to was to go that route versus writing the whole manuscript mm -hmm. because editors sometimes like to kind of help shape the vision with you. Um, so it was, the proposal itself was 95 pages or so. So it wasn't short. There were, you know, chapters in there. And the general map of how the book was going to look ended up being pretty similar. I mean, certainly the arc of, you know, my own character arc and, and those kind of things. Um, however, though, I scrapped the whole first chapter and started in a new place. Originally, I started in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up starting, you know, the moment we got to Georgia instead. Mm -hmm. And there were certain stories I decided to tell that had not been in the proposal, like Mira's story, because she's a character who leaves. So she kind of falls off, yes. which is something I struggled with a bit because I really, I wanted to write a memoir that hopefully read like a novel, like that felt real, but that immersed you and engaged you the way a novel would. I wanted characters that you came to care about. But it was also important for me to sh to show that experience in a lot of, for a lot of reasons because not only was I showing this difficult night in their marriage, um, but I was also I was brand new there, and Andrew had just gotten back from his first deployment, and I was seeing a different side of him. Mm -hmm. You know, in that moment when he said, "Where does he keep his gun?" Mm -hmm. and um, because the you know, he was getting violent and he was drunk and also not just a different side of him, but also a new reality that I lived with, which was that everyone had guns, mm -hmm. I mean, which was that there were, and also not just guns, but like combat skills and possible, you know, carrying around hard stuff they've been through. And yes. so there was this kind of like higher stake feeling at times to life at home, even just at a barbecue, mm -hmm. because you were with these guys who'd been through a lot. And also there was this, you know, gun culture that I had never been a part of. It was just really different to going to a dinner party in New York City. Yeah. I mean, the so the, like all of that, now, you know, now suddenly seems so soft yes. and everything felt really like supercharged and sharp in a new way. And I, and I wanted to show that. So that was new. And, um, I think, you know, there were also just sort of insights and understandings about myself. I knew that I really wanted to talk about home in a larger way mm -hmm. and that idea of like the search for it and the longing for it and that idea of feeling like a stranger in a strange land, even when you're, when you're in the place you grew up, you know, I, I wanted that to be a trend, but I think I understood new things about it as I wrote because writing is how I understand. Absolutely. Yeah. You can work through it. And you know, as this, the same thing is, how did you work with Hannah? Hannah was your editor. Did you, uh -huh. did you like sit down and did you hand her everything? And then she made notes and got back to you or how did that work out? I know Hannah for years. <laughs> oh, Hannah's so wonderful. Yeah. So she was very, she just said, we'll work however you want to work. And, you know, we can go chapter by chapter or you can go write the manuscript or, you know, let's see what happens. And I decided to just go write the manuscript because mm -hmm. I, I kind of thought I'd want her hand holding, but at the end of the day, uh, there was so much that, um, I needed to kind of rearrange. And there was so much that felt like vulnerable as I was working on it. And also there were things I got wrong because there was so much 
I was constrained by fact, right? And so <laughs> I would, I was doing a lot of research as I was doing this into my own life in terms of journals, emails, Facebook posts, interviewing women who are in the book, talking to my husband, reading books, you know, all, all the things and realizing like, oh, that's not, it's not the year that happened or that's not, you know, and I had to do some massive rearranging yeah. and rewriting of entire like plot points because I was like, that was not when that happened, Simone, you know, and you cannot get that wrong. <laughs> so I found that I, I did that mostly on my own. I did also work an old professor of mine. She does developmental editing and she kind of, I would give her big chunks on occasion and she would kind of give me some big picture notes um, that was, was helpful as I went along. Yeah. And then Anna really came in at the end and said, okay, this is wonderful, but it's really long. <laughs> and it's still really long, but I am not joking when I say that my first draft was 175,000 words. And when I got it to hand, it was 150 and she helped me get it down to 125. But it doesn't read long. Like I never oh, felt like, God. I didn't <laughs> feel <laughs> so long winded. I you know what I love too, though, is um, like the, the chapter heads. Cause you sort of knew what you were getting into when you got to someplace it's like redeployment oh no we're not going out again and you know like this is what's going to happen but i never felt like it was long because it was very vested i have to admit i'll be honest i mixed up rachel and haley a lot <laughs> oh you did was the street. but that was just me that is oh me. i know well maybe it's not no i get I it i understand I get I think it. It's me. I think it's me. Remember, you were you were using different names too for people. You know, you were using yes. different names and stuff like that as well. So I know the names have been changed. Did has anybody read an advanced copy of it? Have the wives read it yet? Yes, Rachel and Haley have and both what, read it. And what they say? What was their feedback? You know, I think it was a really interesting experience for both of them and a different experience for both of them. You know, they said I really showed just the intensity and challenges of that time. And I think it was also hard because there was stuff that they, I don't know, had set aside and didn't want to think about. And it kind of was, you know, they thought they, they were, they were revisiting it mm -hmm. and at that time together. Um, and it was funny. There were, I think it's weird to read about yourself. You know, Rachel was like, well, I, I worry that I come off as superficial because I, <laughs> because I wanted a wedding, but really, it was, you know, and, and I was like, uh, you are the least superficial character in this book. <laughs> like you are such a generous spirit, spirited open arm. And that was this initial, like initially, I think they both had the, it's weird to read yourself on the page. Of course, of and course. so the, some of those insecurities came up, but they ultimately, I think, uh, ex experienced reading it as a gift. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it was, I think it was, interesting too just to see my point of view on intimate moments that could probably have been different you know for them and then you were the narrator of the book too so you narrated mm -hmm. the whole thing now tell us what that was like because now it's your story you're reading it and then you can't make any changes you can't change the word the or any playing any along oh, the way terrible mm -hmm. no was it tough? <laughs> oh you mean an audio yeah yes, I was audio saying. your audio reading um yeah, that was such a trip and it was and such a fun and weird experience because it kind of, it had to be crunched into this marathon time, but mm -hmm. with my kid's schedule yeah. and we had to find somewhere local. So I ended up going to this little like hip hop audio booth play. I mean, I can think of the, with the 27 year old Matt, who's a sound engineer, who's amazing. I love him, but he's used to like doing guys, like doing night sessions with guys doing hip hop. And okay. so this like suburban mom comes in to narrate the book. And I think it was just, it was such a new experience for both of us. Right. Uh, I mean, this awesome producer in LA who I loved and it was really wonderful. I mean, I got, there were really intimate moments where I was reading it to these two people and they were doing their job, but they were listening mm -hmm. with a uh, deep attention. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was beautiful you know, to, to have that experience and to really, to have, to experience a reader, you know, there weren't readers, but it's kind of like getting to get a view into the, yeah. what that's like a reader reading your work. Um, and it was really hard. I mean, I really have a new appreciation for audio narrators. It was exhausting. I, I, I felt dizzy at the end of each day. Cause you know what? I was reading, they said at a professional pace. So I'd read like a hundred pages a day. Right. And, and it was 
freeing because I'm a perfectionist. And I remember the first day, 15 minutes in, the producer was like, yeah, we cannot go at this pace. Like you can't stop and redo it. No, you just got to go. You know, <laughs> and she would stop me when it, when I needed to rephrase things, but I really, I was doing stuff on the fly and I, and I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I was doing my, cause I was, I was trying to decide how to do people's voices because there's a lot of dialogue in the right, book. Right, right, right. And I didn't, I wasn't going to suddenly become a voice actor. And so I wasn't going to suddenly do like Southern Stan, my landlord's mm -hmm. accent in full because I would have butchered the crap out of it. And so I just kind of had to add a little bit of something to make it, you know, sound mm -hmm. different yeah. than I did. But it was, it was really fun and, and really challenging. And, but I'm really glad I got to do it. I mean, it was yeah. a great experience and it was also weird yeah to read the book and be like you would because when you really when you read a book aloud you realize like when words are extraneous or mm -hmm. when you just realize mm -hmm. okay I could have could have changed that sentence or could have changed that paragraph certainly with that part's hard yeah. but you get over it it's, but no it still works it's still every good. writer every writer feels that way no matter what about their books I think and you oh just, totally totally you've got to go sit there and read it again oh no please not now you know <laughs> <laughs> so here's what was the wives always the title yes yes it was I feel like there couldn't be anything else and how I mean, about the cover it was always the title for me which is funny titles are really hard like I always struggled with them with essays or short stories I did write fiction uh before I got into journalism I wrote fiction and I hope well I plan actually I have a plan for a novel after this um so but I've always struggled with titling but I just knew it was the wives yeah wives begin with because it's a I mean I think wife is this sort of I don't know I talk about in the book right like husband has this kind of earthy comfort and like weight and sturdiness to it and then wife you know I don't even as a word is like a little thin and I feel like it's almost a diminishment somehow I don't know and certainly there are ways I talk about in the book that it can be used like oh she's just a wife like she didn't go to combat she didn't go to ranger school mm -hmm. she's you know she's just this kind of invisible attachment that's that's here um but I think there was also like she's a wife you know and she's the like there's a moment when one of the characters in the book gets a medal you know for the heroine of the infantry and she's really proud of it and it's because she supported her husband through many deployments and raised kids and you know I wish she got more than a medal but it is but she is a heroine to the infantry and she is a heroine I mean these women I mean I, they are heroic to me and I think heroic in general they're quietly heroic but they're absolutely heroic and I really want that to come you know, through a couple weeks ago, we were interviewing Chris and Hannah. People, we said at the end, what could we do for veterans today? Like women veterans or veterans in general, what could do today? And I think the same question is, what can you do if you live in an area like I live in New Jersey where no one's deployed? Like, you know, I know there's one person that's overseas, but there's yeah. this, what, what can you do? What can you bring? What can you do if you're not in the kind of area that goes on and where things go on? And Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting point to bring up because you're in an area where people know like what you're doing, you know, and, and I don't, it's like, you don't seek people out after a certain, like, you know, once your kids are grown, you don't go out seeking people. Let me go find new people. You know, it's not yeah. quite the yeah. same way. So you're saying, yeah, you know, there are a lot of communities where people are in the reserves or mm -hmm. uh, guard. Right. And so they, and those communities are not super tight knit, like in their actual, mm -hmm. you know, units they don't tend to be and then exactly the world that they're in is is mostly civilians and I think it's incredibly isolating and I've talked to women who are wives who've gone through that you know um during COVID which was really hard and really friends hard. are going through it now and I think they just I mean one gosh an awareness that they're going through it which I know is hard how do you how do you even find that out um but I think I'm sure there are nonprofits and and mm -hmm. groups of some kind and then really just support in terms of showing up I mean I think that's the thing I really learned in Georgia is that I if your main value is showing up then you're you're my kind of person <laughs> you know like yeah. the rest of the values are secondary yeah and and I now really value somebody 
who is like, who is reliable and who is, who is there when you need them. And I really try to be that person too. So, and that could be in any way. I mean, that could be just dropping off food. I, there's, there's somebody who did that for me at some, at some point when my husband deployed, it was a mom I knew for my kid's daycare and she didn't have any experience with the military, but she just said, I made you dinner and I'm just going to drop it off at your door. Yeah. And you know, you know, you don't have to, you don't even have to talk to me. I'm just going to drop it off at your door. Yeah. Uh, but also invites, you know, like remembering that people are, that they don't, that on the weekends and holidays, that they don't have a, a main member of their family. And mm -hmm. so like invite them to your house, invite yeah. them to meals, invite them to celebrations. They are lonely and they will almost always say yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say yes so much more than I think I would uh, if my husband weren't gone so yeah. much. And it's and great. also if you were in New York. There's so many friendships that I don't think I would have otherwise. And if you were in New York, you could go to a museum. You could go do this. You could go do that. It's harder when you're in a different, a smaller community, especially when you were down in Georgia. It's totally different on what's available to you to be able to do, you know? Absolutely. Yes. I think that's true, especially when you don't have kids. And yeah. I, But I think, you know, I think once you have kids, no matter where you are, I think there's this like yearning for community that is, I mean, it's, it's strong no matter what, obviously, but I have felt it really strongly with children because they so clearly need to be part of some kind of village. Like, they <laughs> yeah. just need it. They yeah. And they want multiple adults around. Right. They look at you, one adult, and they're like, then no, we're going to wreak havoc. <laughs> we, you are outnumbered and we know, you know? <laughs> and so I think, I mean, mostly it's just like company. Yeah. I just, just be there, be there. Me, or people giving me a call or people asking me how it is, you know, like, oh, or just how long has he been gone? What's, how's it, how are the kids doing? Yeah. Uh, and not sugarcoating it and not, I think a lot of people were like, well, at least he'll be home pretty soon. Or at least, oh, will he be back for a while then? Or, you know, I think there were sometimes asking a lot of invasive questions. Mm -hmm. That's not very helpful. I think but asking questions of genuine like interest mm -hmm. and just listening is is huge for yeah. sure. It's like just that you know. Okay, we're having dinner tonight. I'm bringing yours over to you. <laughs> no, it's just like, yeah, exactly. I I'll just take dinner. Uh, I mean, I think it's just it's like anything. It's just thinking of people, and I think there are a lot of people in difficult circumstances mm -hmm. that need to be thought of. And and there are a lot of, I mean, all of us are mostly just getting through. We all need to be thought of, right? <laughs> um, so this is just one perspective, you know, and. Uh, well, you know, it's really funny when my, my son, younger son was young, he says, um, you know, the real reason I'm on the baseball team, it's got nothing to do with my baseball skills. It's got to do with dad will coach and you'll bring books. And that's really what it is. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> I'm not that good. He says, uh, I got this thing all figured I hear, out. I think Basically, he's there because they need you guys. I love it. And he I says, yeah. So and then cool. my husband would say, you know, like, I could tell him to hold the bat like this 15 times. He never listened. When the coach said, hold it like this, that was what had happened. And so it's these oh, outside it. influences on kids become very important. And I think that you have an opportunity to do it even more because your husband's not there all the time. It's like other people putting their fingerprints, the right fingerprints on kids are important. Absolutely. And I think don't, it's just like, single mothers like don't expect that they're I think that sometimes people are like oh you're a superhero or you're and single mothers are and I'm not comparing myself to a single mother it is a different ball game entirely but just the I think that idea that we're superheroes is like no we're not we're just we're people <laughs> just we're people. like you figuring it out and uh we need community and support you know and so I think I think the hero thing, both for soldiers and, and their families. And is even though I just said these women are heroic, you know, they it are so at the same time, I think painting someone as a hero can be kind of diminishing when, and, and it detracts from really getting to know who they are and what they're dealing with and, and how they're dealing with it. Well, I would love to read your next novel. So chop, chop. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, I can't wait to not write about myself. Let me tell you. If, uh, <laughs> or talk about yourself, which is what you're going to do for the next like, you know, two months, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's fun. And it's such a, I mean, gosh, talk about like a luxury and an amazing well, yeah. life experience that I'm getting to have. Um, but I love novels and I love um, just entering a different world than my own. And I can't wait to be Focusing on that too.
for everybody else, you want to read the wives. You really do, because it's going to give you a whole different, you know, a lot of times we read, my husband and I just finished re re watching Masters of the Air. And we watched, you know, what had happened during World War II. And we watched the Vietnam War on television. But you know what? You only saw the piece. And this book, I feel like, really gets you into what the wives were feeling. Just like, you know, what Rick Kristen is talking about with the women who were the the um, the nurses and, you know, were in the back background and nobody knew who they were. Like, how many times you sit there and say, gee, I wonder what the wives are really feeling. And I think you capture it really well here. So congratulations. Thank you, so Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and so much fun. So much fun talking to you as well. Thank you for having me. And to everybody else, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To. Take care.